Level Up is a regular podcast that brings you topics to help you perform at work and in life at your very highest level. Your host is Dan Kyoto, an executive coach, corporate trainer, and author. He is president of Impact Training and Executive Coaching. And now, here's Dan. Thank you, Jesse, for introducing Level Up. This is a place to go when you want to grow. And today, our guest is a management consultant specializing in developing leadership and organizational capabilities to strengthen performance in public and private sector companies. He has successfully developed strategic plans and directed change projects for a large number of organizations in the public and private sectors. His past positions include senior advisor at Carnegie Mellon University, adjunct professor at Georgia Institute of Technology, and lecturer at Cornell University. His current research is on innovation and technology transfer. And my guest is Dr. Chester Warzynski. Welcome, Chet. Good to have you here on Level Up. Thank you, Dan. I'm delighted to be here with you and and the group. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I think once we tell them what this is about, I know I have found it a very interesting topic that um, we talk about resilience. It's just a fabulous word that I really hadn't thought about too much until you brought it to my attention. But why don't we start by you telling us what resilience is? Well, you know, resilience is um, uh, kind of the, um, uh, an adaptive mechanism for dealing with disappointment and loss. Um, uh, some people kind of refer to it uh, in, in regard to the immune system. You know, um, uh, something happens, an illness occurs, and, and your body responds to that illness and oftentimes overcomes or even prevents that illness because of this adaptive energy, which um, is part of, uh, of, of the concept of resilience. So resilience kind of means hardiness, flexibility, adaptability. You know, the, the, um, it's, it's an ability to kind of deal with situations effectively uh, and successfully um, um, uh, based upon, you know, your energy. Uh, When I think of resilience, I I, I tend to think of what's called a resilience triangle, which, you know, there are three dimensions to it. One dimension is, you know, how does the body react or adapt uh, to stress? You know, and we know that, uh, you know, we've all heard of the fight or flight syndrome. Uh, which you have a tendency to fight or flight, but uh, hopefully you have more choices than that, you know, from a physiological standpoint. Uh, From a psychological standpoint, it's being being conscious of the options that you have available um, and being able to choose those options that are going to help, you know, further your goals and further your values. Um, and then there's the dimension of um, uh, of context or support. do you have a support system, uh, a, a system of relationships that uh, you know can uh, you can count on when things when you're facing a crisis or facing a challenge or facing a loss in your life? So we all experience loss. We all experience these challenges. It's how we deal with these challenges that um, uh, resilience is all about. You, do you have the capacity to deal with them successfully um, and to be able to achieve your goals and realize your values? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And a good definition. Do you think that it's more important today than in the past? Uh, You know, that's an interesting question because, um, you know, I don't know how important it was, you know, in the past. Um, uh, Today, we're much more educated. We're much more knowledgeable of um, uh, of, of how our bodies respond to stress and some of the choices we have. Um, I I think in the past, we kind of um, took a lot more for granted, you know, uh, and you know, just look around you today and you see people that are exercising and managing their diets and um, making sure they get enough sleep and rest. And I mean, these are, these are important ways of building resistance and maintaining resist, uh, resilience um, uh, to be able to deal with some of the challenges. So, you know, in one sense, I think, um, you know, we've, we've, we've always had these mechanisms, you know, in the past, but we maybe weren't as conscious 
uh, of them and their implications um, as we are today. So I think it's very important today. Um, um, and I, I think that people who are concerned about resilience and thinking about resilience um, can do something to really help improve their resilience, maintain their health. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, that's associated with resilience is not just health, but people are talking about um, success. When we look at, uh, you know, the factors that are involved in success, success in work and success in life and fulfillment in life, uh, resilience plays an important part. Uh, indeed, I think even um, longevity is a, is a key factor. Uh, resilience is a key factor in longevity today. So I think it is a very important topic today, uh, and I think it's something that uh, most people are starting to pay attention to. I think you're right about that. Some of what you're saying in terms of energy and fitness and nutrition, all of these things that people do read about and understand that that is what would make a resilient person. You've got to have the energy and uh, be able to do all these things. Mm -hmm. You, you think about um, workaholics. We used to use that term all the time. Yeah. So they just work and work and work. And, and really, what is that achieving? If you're not a peak performer, if, if you just work and you aren't achieving things, then um, that really doesn't push you into the resilience that you could have, right? You're having too much fun today. <laughs> and you, you could be depleting yourself of the adaptive energy or the resilience. Um, that could affect your health. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the challenges we face. You know, overwork is one of those challenges. Um, uh, you know, some of the challenges we're facing today in terms of the coronavirus is, uh, you know, uh, important as far as dealing with resilience or your resilience. Because uh, for some people, you know, who, whose immune system has been depleted, uh, and this is particularly true in, in uh, elderly people, um, uh, they're much more subjective, uh, subject to, to uh, you know, acquiring that, uh, that virus than, uh, than other people. Um, and so it's important that we try to, you know, look at how we're responding, you know, to, our, to the challenges in our society. You know, just looking at the stock market today, you know, a lot of people are very upset over what's going on in the stock market. And some people, you know, are actually depleting a lot of their resources you know, and their emotions in terms of what's happening in the stock market. So there are a lot of factors and a lot of things that can cause us um, to deplete um, uh, our resilience and can affect our health, um, as well as our satisfaction and fulfillment in life. Yes. You know, you bring up coronavirus. It's a perfect example of um, how resilient are we? Because for some people, it doesn't seem to affect them too much. However, if you had a big event with more than 250 people, um, you are affected because it may not be held. You have to do it in a different way. I noticed this morning they're building these units that are going to be used to put people in who have the coronavirus. It costs about a million dollars to make them, and they were making them, but not quite like they are, so they're doing it to suit the situation. Um, Something else that I thought was interesting, and get your take on this. In organizations, sometimes it takes time to do things. So we may think we're resilient and we can bounce back and make things happen, but there's one um, coffee chain that um, if you wanted to get a change, you'd have to talk to the manager who would have to talk to the district manager who would have to talk to committees and then it goes to the home office. Mm -hmm. And if you're here in Florida during a uh, season, which we're in, that won't happen until after season, I'm told, because they're too busy. So they'll do it later. So it may take months and months and months to get anything done. Yet at the same coffee place, overnight, they got rid of the cups got rid of the dishes, put in new napkin dispensers where you can only get one out, and they're using antiseptic and cleaning supplies like crazy, and they all look like they know what they're doing and they're going to make it happen. To me, they look really resilient. Isn't that interesting? Um, even if we consider ourselves resilient, 
um, we might be able to take it to another level. Do you think? No, absolutely. You know, I mean, we talk about resilient, you know, resilience. You know, we have a tendency to talk about resilience on a personal level or an individual level. Um, but organizations, you know, also need to be resilient. You know, we talk about agility in organizations today. How agile are they in terms of adapting to changes in their environment? So the coffee house that you mentioned, you know, that it initiate all these changes is one that's very agile. It recognizes one the importance of the of, of, of the of, of making these changes for their customers, so it's very customer oriented. Uh, but it's also concerned about the health of customers, um, and it's making these changes rather than waiting for these changes because the consequences of not making these changes would be devastating to could be devastating to their future. Um, and so it's a, it's a, this is a ex good example of a conscious choice, a conscious choice of a leader to make these changes, to bring about, you know, to make the environment safer for the customers um, uh, is, a, is, is a, a good example of a resilient organization. Yeah, very true. And I'm seeing more and more of that. So that, that is wonderful. I wonder if you could share with us some characteristics that, a resilient person has so that we can kind of examine that in ourselves. What would some of those characteristics be? Well, you know, I mean, there are a number of different characteristics that have been identified or traits that have been identified. Um, you know, one of them is optimism. People who are optimistic tend to be a little bit more resilient. In other words, they're seeing the world more as an opportunity than as a threat. Um, when you're seeing the world as a threat, you're depleting yourself with a lot of adaptive energy. Uh, so thinking about this, you know, resilient people manage their emotions. They have what we call emotional intelligence. They're able to understand what they're feeling, but they also empathize and understand what other people are feeling. You know, and that's a good, that, that empathy there is a good example from the coffee house. The, the leader had great empathy for the customers, you know, in terms of making those changes. So they have empathy and they're able to make decisions to regulate their emotions. They're not really stuck in the status quo. Um, and, and because change disrupts, change is very disruptive um, on an individual and an organizational level. Um, and it's how people respond to that change, which is most important. Um, and if you're not in control of your emotions, uh, you know, the coronavirus is causing you a lot of fear, a lot of angst, and it's depleting your, your, your energy. If you're doing something to try to uh, compensate or prevent that coronavirus, at least you're taking action. You're going to be less depleted. Um, and you're going to be less worried about it because you've anticipated what some of those uh, consequences could be, and you're trying to prevent them. Yes. So taking action is one way of managing your emotions. So it's, it's really managing and regulating your emotions. If you're very control-oriented, if you're very fearful, um, and, you're, and you're not responding to that, you're depleting your, ener your adaptive energy, and you're actually affecting your immune system and your health. Yes. You know, there's one airlines that announced the other day that um, you can fly on our airlines. Uh, it's not going to be an issue because we prepared for this. Um, several years ago, we started training for something like this to happen, and so here's what we did then. Here's what we're going to do now. Right. So. So don't you think that proactivity is good too, makes you more resilient when instead of being reactive and having those kind of feelings that you're proactive. Absolutely. And you know, optimism, pro, being proactive is really important because it's, you know, it ties in with being self-aware. Uh, when you're aware of your own emotions, you're aware of what other people are going through, and you anticipate and be proactive in terms of addressing those feelings. That's really one of the things we talk about in terms of emotional intelligence. You know, self-confidence is another important factor. 
Um, you know, how confident are you in terms of if you're not self-confident, you're always worrying. That's a, that's a drain. That's going to be depleting your adaptive energy. But there's another one that most people don't deal with or think about, you know, off the bat. And that's spirituality. You know, one of the characteristics of, of, of resilience is, you know, when we look at people who are spiritual, they tend to live longer. They tend to uh, be more resilient. They tend to be able to deal with crisis better. They tend to be more healthy um, than people who aren't spiritual. So spirituality gives you a, a, a dimension that you can look at that can really make a difference in terms of your resilience. That's excellent. You know, that goes right along with the Blue Zones program, trying to help people uh, live longer. And there is this circle of nine things that you can do to live a longer life, live a healthy life, a happy life. And as you mentioned that, I thought it was very interesting that the spiritual component is the thing that adds the most years to your life to have that spirituality and to be with other people to kind of have a a communal celebration regularly said that it really can make a difference. So that's very interesting. You know, having that support system, you know, that, um, that, that people need, you know, in terms of overcoming loss and dealing with crisis in their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I have more questions about resilience of, If you'll stay right there, Dr. Warzynski. And uh, right now we approach a time for a break. On the other side of the show, we're going to continue to explore this. This is Dan Kyoto, your host with Dr. Chester Warzynski. And you're listening to Level Up. We'll be right back after this. Thank you for joining us for the second side of Level Up. If you're just tuning in, I'm Dan Kyoto, and my guest is Dr. Chester Warzynski, a leadership and organizational change specialist. And we are dissecting resilience to try to figure out what that is all about. Um, I was thinking that if we find some people in our organizations that need help with resilience, there are some things maybe we could do for them. Um, what kinds of things should we be looking for and what might we do to help them? Well, I think, you know, there are a number of things. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, uh, Google does, for example, is it allows people to exercise and to take, you know, breaks during the workday um, and sometimes even uh, work uh, or Today, it's more common than, than in the past, but to work remotely, you know, to, to work in an environment where they, you know, uh, can be more resilient so they don't deplete as much of their uh, energy. So I think some, giving people an opportunity to make some choices, giving them some autonomy in terms of the workplace, I think is an important way to deal with uh, resilience. But I think also that, you know, education. Uh, being able to provide people with um, uh, training that can help them to understand, you know, what's happening in their, you know, in terms of uh, resu- uh, resilience, helping them to diagnose, you know, whether or not they're approaching burnout, which is when you, um, you know, you lack resilience and you become very vulnerable to illness and disease. Um, it's um, so education can be a really important part of uh, building resilience. Um, it, it, helping people to become more emotionally intelligent. You know, we 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 we're, we're doing a lot of training in that area today uh, 
um, uh, with leaders because we found that one of the primary characteristics of successful leaders is that they're emotionally intelligent. That means they're empathic, they're able to develop relationships, they really care about the other people, the, the people they're working with, um, and they, they look to nurture each other as they go forward in the workplace. So I think, you know, emotional intelligence is really a, a critical area that leaders need to address um, uh, in the workplace. And, 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 and not only just uh, leaders, but I mean to address with, with all employees. Um, because making the right choices and understanding the options that we have available uh, in terms of our, how we're going to use our adaptive energy and whether it's going to be in a healthy way or an unhealthy way is really fundamental to success. I think a lot of the, um, uh, uh, the programs uh, dealing with, um, you know, having uh, options for people to talk to a counselor uh, in the workplace are, is important. And many companies have these um, uh, mechanisms uh, for people who have financial problems to people who have um, you know, personal or emotional issues to be able to discuss it with a professional. So seeking professional advice and having professional advice on, on, on hand, uh, I think is very uh, prudent from an organizational standpoint. That's great. I'm glad you outlined some of those things. I think that leaders should consider that. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a, a company that I'm working with where um, there are two leaders who have success in getting people to do the right things, going above and beyond. And when they ask them, they said, we love it here. We're very happy here. Uh, but one of the other leaders is having difficulty because she can't quite understand why people don't do what they're supposed to do. And this generation and all of these things. And the more I looked at it, I feel like the two leaders that have success, um, their people are very resilient. They just want to go above and beyond and be there. Whereas maybe as leaders we should look at our style and make sure that we are encouraging the resilience in people absolutely i mean you know if 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 our people are healthy we're going to have less absenteeism we're going to have higher productivity um if our people are making choices um that um are increasing productivity um as opposed to um, making choices that um, cause relationship problems in the workplace. We're going to have better teams. We're going to have more cohesive and coordinated action uh, in the workplace. And so we're going to get better results. So it's taking time to, you know, have to recognize some of the signs and symptoms of uh, burnout or the signs and symptoms of a lack of resilience uh, that can help an organization put in place the right support systems and mechanisms. Something else we should look for is when we're interviewing people, you know, we're talking about resilience and what they're like when they're in the workplace, but should we be including the questions in interviews that will show us that we have a resilient person here to start with? What do you think? That's a, I think that's a great question, Dan. Um, and I, I think many organizations are already doing that. Um, uh, for example, you know, one of the questions we ask in hiring people are, you know, what have you accomplished? You know, and we live, get them to list all their accomplishments, you know, and, and you know, that's a, that's a good thing to understand what they, what successes they've had. But in doing so, we should also ask them, uh, what are some of the things you had to overcome to achieve uh, these accomplishments? And what did you do to overcome them? So we try to understand how they deal with conflict and how they deal with change um, and how they deal with crisis when things don't go well. What do they do? How do they respond? And what are some of the healthy ways of responding and what are some of the unhealthy ways of responding? I think it was George Washington Carver who said, don't tell me just about all your accomplishments. Tell me what you've had to do to overcome, you know, in life. So it, it says a lot about your willpower. It says a lot about your self-discipline. Um, and their answer says a lot about how the, the choices they make and the judgments they make uh, in terms of how to manage 
manage themselves, which also has implications for how they manage other people and how they lead other people. So uh, I think getting at some of those um, uh, you know, answers is really important from an organizational point of view. For example, you know, if you find people uh, who are blaming other people, who deny that there's any problems, who act out impulsively. I mean, these are areas that we sort of look at in terms of a person's emotional intelligence, who lack empathy, you know, um, who um, um, act impulsively. I mean, these are signs that, you know, the individual is not going to be able to establish the kind of relationships and to work as part of a team to really accomplish uh, the organization's goals. And so these are questions that we should definitely be asking during the interview process as well as, you know, following up with um, uh, references and so and, and, and doing, um, you know, good uh, investigation uh, of an employee's background. That is true. I'm thinking of resumes that you might look at, and I could have a person that looks like they've had a stellar career, they've accomplished a lot, yet they may choose not to include something that they ran away from that uh, they were given, but never achieved. So we wouldn't know what they do when they're challenged with something. Interesting. Interesting. Um, do you have some people that you think of that uh, national, um, nationally known, or folks that you would say are or were resilient? Do any come uh, to mind for you? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I think uh, I can look back over the course of my career, and I can think of many people, you know, who had uh, attained a, you know, a, a high level of success in terms of their role in the organization from CEO, you know, vice presidents and so on. Um, and I think what, one of the things you find is that most successful people um, are resilient and have learned to deal with disappointments and loss and change in their lives and therefore are more adaptable and are using their adaptive energy uh, wisely. Um, when I think historically or look, look recently, I, I saw a documentary on Hedy Lamar. Um, I think it was on um, uh, uh, Prime or Netflix, one of those. Um, and, uh, you know, she was a person who had a tremendously inventive mind um, uh, and was able to deal with uh, um, disappointment and deal with problems that she had um, um, in a very successful way. I mean, she was um, uh, um, uh, not able to... Um, uh, control who or her, what her role was in films and what the script was in terms of films. And so she went out and she created her own films. <laughs> um, she, she had created this invention called frequency jumping, you know, which is being used today in radar and in, uh, our, our Bluetooth and uh, our iPhones and so on. Um, and she persisted in getting recognition, even though, the, you know, the Navy stole that idea. So she seemed to me to be someone who is very uh, resilient. I mean, you look in history and you can see Michael Jordan in sports, you know, um, you know, he was not tall enough when he was starting to play basketball and he wasn't, uh, you know, on the first string, you know, initially at North Carolina and then he, he just grew into this superstar. Uh, Walt Disney, who had a lot of bankruptcies, you know, and, um, you know, struggled, uh, but overcame those struggles, uh, you know, to, to create Disney one of the most successful companies you know in the world so uh, you know i think if you if you if you look around you and you, i mean you can even look within your own family at your parents and other people who have been very successful um and who have taught you and have mentored you you know you see that they've had this resilience so uh, we need to we need to be able to have those kinds of role models um, uh, and people that we can look up to um, in terms of resilience, because we're all going to face disappointment and, and conflict and, um, and failure and loss in our lives, but it's how we deal with those that are most important. And that, that kind of reminds me a little bit of the research, you know, that's been done. There's a, there's a, a gentleman called George Vallant who um, was chair of psychiatry at Harvard Medical, 
And uh, he did, uh, he's written four books, uh, really interesting books, but he's done some longitudinal studies. These are studies of 60 years or more, where they traced a cohort of the same people over that period of time. And then one of the interesting things about longitudinal research is you find out that a lot of the things you thought about in the short term are not correct. Um, and what he found, though, was that the way we defend ourselves when things don't go well is directly related to health, satisfaction, or fulfillment in life, and success. And he was able to uh, uh, differentiate uh, healthy coping mechanisms from unhealthy adaptive mechanisms. And the healthy coping mechanisms, and, and we tend to react unconsciously when there's a stress disappointment, and sometimes when we react um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unhealthy way, we spiral down and we get worse, we deplete our adaptive energy, we get sick, uh, and we fail to accomplish our goals. But the healthy coping mechanisms, he thought, are one to be able to anticipate in advance. And you were mentioning this earlier, anticipating in advance what's going to happen to us and we're not going to always be successful. And then having a plan and a problem-solving process in place where we can bring in support people and work on solving that problem. So it's called anticipation and problem-solving. That's number one. Number two is altruism. That's, you know, when things aren't going well, Instead of thinking about how badly I'm feeling and worrying about the situation, go out and help somebody else. It has a positive payback. We make we do good for others, um, and ultimately that helps us. You know, in terms of our health, we're not depleting our adaptive energy, but we're using it constructively, and we're feeling good about the outcome. A third one is sublimation, and that is really rechanneling when we can't accomplish. Our goals, when there's conflict and crisis, do we have a hobby that we can fall back to? Can we be channeled to something that's important to us that's going to give us a positive payback? Um, the, we, we also need to be able to prioritize. Um, you've written books on time management. You know how important prioritizing is and taking one of those priorities and, and, and even making a dent in it, uh, it has a positive payback and we feel good and it's motivating and it, it motivates us to accomplish our other priorities. Um, and then finally, you know, it's uh, uh, having a sense of humor being able to, to, to laugh at ourselves and laugh at the situation. Um, and that can uh, really have a salutary effect in terms of our health and our satisfaction. So we can make these choices. We, we can become conscious of our unhealthy defense mechanisms, which include blaming other people, lying, making excuses, rationalizing, acting out impulsively, um, even doing the opposite of what we would like to be doing. Uh, and we can become conscious of, of the healthy coping mechanisms and choose those mechanisms to be able to be more resilient and to get a positive payback and to really make a difference in terms of our lives. Valent found that those five factors were really critical in terms of success, health, and satisfaction based on the longitudinal studies, you know, looking at people 60, over 60 years. So, you know, the data is, you know, is, is clear. I mean, we can make some choices to manage our resilience, to manage our emotional intelligence, um, as opposed to just reacting to situations and worrying about situations and feeling that the world is against us. We can be more optimistic and we can uh, make better choices. Excellent. You know, I think that's a good point for us to stop, even though I don't want to. And I think people who view this are going to be like me. Um, you've made me feel more resilient than I did when I started this. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dan. For thank you for all the your wisdom. Appreciate it very much. We appreciate your time with us, too, in watching Level Up and welcome you back anytime. Again, today my guest was Dr. Chester Warzynski, and we talked about resilience. So think about resilience in your own life. Where are you at, and where do you want to be? I want to salute Storm Cloud Marketing and their great team of professionals who put these 
video podcast together. And you can now find Level Up, the video podcast, on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google, iTunes, and YouTube. Also, you can go to my website, impactbydan.com, and look under podcast for all the 37 episodes that we have. So now it's time for you to go level up. Cheers.